In my last video, I shared with you a little bit of detail about my mother's hoarding disorder and about my own personal experience trying to help my mother uh, have a positive improvement in some aspects of how a hoarding disorder was affecting her. In this video, I wanted to share some of the specifics, things, some of the mistakes I made, and uh, as well as some of the ways that I learned to communicate better with my mother. I did do quite a bit of research before I went and spoke with my mother each time. And even within doing all that research, I was researching psychologists and therapists who specialize in hoarding disorder. Even with that, I still made a ton of mistakes. Oftentimes what you think is going to be helpful is the opposite of helpful. Um, for example, if you come over to someone's house and say, oh my gosh, I can help you clean up this mess. You would think that that's helpful, but wow, that can really have negative impacts. So I'm gonna walk you through some of these do's and don'ts. I'm also gonna put these in the comments section so you can just read those or copy and paste them. Uh, I've given these do's and don'ts to pretty much everyone who uh, I have talked with my mother at this point because it really helps set her at ease to not trigger her. And these are do's and don'ts that I put together based on other people's, particularly psychologists and therapists, ideas around how to talk to a hoarder. These are what I found to be most valuable for my own personal experience. I'm gonna start with some of the don'ts, what, you, what not to do, and I basically did all these things. I made all the mistakes. Don't use judgmental language. Like anyone else, individuals with hoarding disorder will not be receptive to negative comments about the state of their home or their character. So when you say things like, wow, what a mess, or what kind of person lives like this, you're attacking either their home or their own character. Imagine your own response if someone came into your home and spoke in this manner, especially if you already felt ashamed. And this is key here. I had no idea my mom was ashamed because she would always defend uh, her living situation and claim that she was, she was an old goat and this is just how she lived and everyone needs to just accept it. And um, she would also say things like, you know, she's a collector and she's found all these really nice treasures. So in her mind, or at least the way she spoke, I thought there was no shame. And when I had conversations with my mother where we were able to go deeper into her psyche, it, she very much opened up about a constant state of shame that she has. And so if she's already ashamed and I walk in and say something like, wow, look at this mess. It's really triggering her into something that she is has, having a tough time navigating already. Don't use words that devalue or negatively judge possessions. People who hoard are often aware that others do not view their possessions and homes as they do. They often react strongly to words that reference their possessions negatively, like trash, garbage, or junk. And this one is also important. Don't let your nonverbal expression say what you're thinking. Individuals with compulsive hoarding are likely to notice nonverbal messages that convey judgment, like frowns. And a great example where this happened to me is... Um, when I would walk into my mom's home, the smell was horrendous. If you watched my last video, uh, you'd know, well, I'll just share with you. So one of the things about my mom's hoarding is the carpet, which was very ancient and filthy already to begin with. Uh, my mom's two dogs peed and pooped exclusively inside and on the carpet. And they would hold it literally while on a walk until they got home and then they would, they would go at home. And my mom would let the poop dry out for days at a time, sometimes weeks if she couldn't find it, before she'd clean it up because when it was hardened, she found it easier and when it was dried up, it was easier for her to clean up with just a paper towel. And the urine, uh, she would often just let that dry. And so this, the smell when you walked into this home was overwhelming. And what would happen is I would, I would feel a sense of disgust because I would just, bleh. so my face would give away this sense of disgust I had and that would immediately set my mom and I into a conflict pattern and I wanted no part of conflict. Here I was going way out of my way. My mom lives in a small town in Idaho. It's not easy to get to so I would have driven really far and my goal was to help her address some of this stuff. So the last thing I wanted to do was have conflict with her but unfortunately the very first thing I would do is show this disgust because 
I was literally disgusted by the smell and the situation. You know, you'd see five piles of dog poop um, in varying states of dryness and decay, and that was just absolutely disgusting to me. Um, and my face would show that. So even though I was being careful not to say anything, my face betrayed what I was thinking. And so that would make my mom already into this kind of conflict zone. So not just your words, but your expressions. Uh, you know, humans tune into our expressions just as much or sometimes more than our words. Don't make suggestions about the person's belongings. Even well-intentioned suggestions about discarding items are usually not well received by those with hoarding. This is absolutely true with my mom. Uh, making suggestions actually has the opposite effect. Uh, don't try to persuade or argue with the person. Efforts to persuade individuals to make a change in their home or behavior often have the opposite effect. The person actually talks themselves into keeping the items. And I certainly experienced this. So if, if we were trying to persuade my mom to do something, uh, that using logic and reasoning was just an absolute disaster. So uh, trying to work through and, and reason with her was having the opposite of effect. Uh, for example, that carpet that I told you about, it took me well over a decade to figure out how do I talk to her in a way that we can get this carpet situation cleaned up. Um, just a quick aside, we did finally get that carpet dealt with, so the carpet got removed. Uh, we put a big piece of it outside in the yard for a few weeks. I put vinyl flooring down, which can always be cleaned perfectly, so if there is an accident, then she could clean it perfectly. And I installed a dog door, and so now the dogs, they would go outside to find that carpet they were used to peeing on, and so now the dogs are, are potty trained, so they no longer have accidents in the home. They actually go outside now to poop and pee. So that situation luckily is um, dealt with. Uh, there's still more to go, um, but you know, using these do's and don'ts helped me figure out how to talk to my mom about getting that carpet out of her home. That I think that carpet was a big part of her poor health because it was just giving off such toxic air quality. Uh, the last don't is don't touch the person's belongings without explicit permission. Those who hoard often have strong feelings and beliefs about their possessions and often find it upsetting when another person touches their things. Anyone visiting the home of someone with hoarding should only touch the person's belongings if they have the person's explicit permission. This was certainly true in my case. I was in the kitchen one day and you know I was with my mom and I was trying to figure out how do we make this kitchen usable. It's very it's not a usable kitchen. You can't there's no counter space. Uh, there's this is really impossible to use. So she always just eats food directly from the fridge, uh, and she generally eats over the sink, not even with a, you know, a plate or a, not at a table. She just hovers over the sink and eats uh, food, like fried chicken that she bought at the grocery. So I'm wanting her to be able to use her kitchen, so she can cook more healthy food, and she has tons of cookbooks that she never uses. And they're just taking up space and they're taking up space in areas where we could actually have food or have items that she could cook with or even just free space that she could use while cooking. And I just touched one of those cookbooks. I just said, uh, what about this cookbook, mom? When was the last time you used it or have you ever used it? And the, the answer I found out much later and on later date is she's never used it. She's never opened it, but she's had it for many years. When I touched that book, it triggered something deep in her. And to this day, I don't know what it is, but by touching it, she was so upset with me in that moment that it was clear that I just needed to leave. And um, very unfortunate, I certainly didn't mean to antagonize her, but she felt antagonized in that moment. She felt that I was attacking her in some way by touching that book. Um, and so unfortunately for me, you know, it's a huge drive to get out to see my mom and I had to leave at that point because I had triggered her too much and she was too upset at that point uh, to handle anything further. And so we had to part ways that day and on a very rough note, you know, not the kind of note you want to part ways with, on, with your mother on. So now let's get to the do's. These are the things that really helped me. And this, I printed out, this is just a single page. It's all available for you in the comments. 
and I would bring this page with me and sort of cheat in the car and read this page of do's and don'ts every single time I engaged with my mom. I printed it out for my sisters and I said, hey, when you talk to mom, can you try to use this language and not do these things? And we've, we, got a, we had a lot of growth in doing this. So the do's are imagine yourself in the hoarding client's shoes. How would you want others to talk to you to help you manage your anger, your frustration, your resentment, your embarrassment, or in my mom's case, shame? So remember, hoarding is not about the physical objects. It's about stuff going on in the mind. It's about emotions. It's about a trauma. It's about a lot of different things. And the items are not a big part of it. It's much more what's going on in their minds. If you just got rid of all the items, a hoarder or someone with hoarding disorder would quickly add things back into their world. So it wouldn't solve anything to just get rid of the stuff. In fact, it would probably make it worse. You know, if you got rid of all their stuff for them and cleaned up their house for them while they were on vacation, they'd probably respond by filling that house to even more fully loaded than it was before you started. So just by dealing with the stuff, you're not really getting to the bottom of hoarding disorder. Um, it's, it's much more working with the human and, and figuring out how to work with their relationship to their emotions um, and some other things. But that's why you want to talk to them about their feelings more so than just focusing on the items. I certainly spent a lot of time trying to focus on the items and then when I started focusing on my mom, uh, we got a lot further into delving into what's going on with her and how we might change some aspects of her life. Another thing to do is to match the person's language. This was really helpful for me. Listen for the individual's manner of referring to his or her possessions, my things, my collections, and use that same, thing, that same language, so your things, your collections, I can't remember at this moment how my mom referred to her stuff, but I used that same language and it was, it was such a relief because instead of her being combative or just thinking there was conflict where there wasn't, she was more relaxed and it was more like a discussion. Also use encouraging language in communicating with people who hoard about the consequences of hoarding. Use language that reduces defensiveness and increases motivation to solve the problem. For example, I see that you have a pathway from your front door to your living room. That's great that you've kept things out of the way so that you don't slip or fall. I can see that you can walk here th through here pretty well by turning sideways. The thing is that somebody else that might need to come into your home, like a firefighter or an emergency responder, would have a difficult time getting through here. They usually have bulky equipment so it's important to have a pathway that's wide enough so they could get through to help you or anyone else who needed it. In fact, safety laws require that you have a certain width for a firefighter to get through. So this is one important change that, that we can make in your home. So notice this example, they started with co complimenting the persons. So instead of starting with, oh, this is too narrow for a firefighter, they started with, oh wow, I, I see that you've got a path here. And so they're talking about the positive first and then they're working in the safety angle. Safety is a really important thing with hoarding disorders. It allows you to focus on something that's real, that's not insulting. Um, you know, it, it is very real that a firefighter might have to get through a home. And if that firefighter can't squeeze through pathways, or, or if all this stuff is on fire, you're creating a hazard for a fireman. And this is somehow connecting because a person who hoards, generally they value life a lot. Uh, so much so they're not willing to harm any life. And so if you're talking to them in a way that starts out constructive, but then mentions how, oh, you might actually be putting a fireman in jeopardy by having this pathway the way it is. It's, it's great that you and I can get through here but if a fireman had to come through here in their bulky gear, you know, it'd actually be very unsafe, especially if some of this stuff was on fire. Um, so that's not gonna work in everyone's situation, but that's just an example of something that is much better than leading with, oh, this pathway is too narrow. Uh, that's gonna automatically set up this defensive 
uh, conflict and, and my mom got very defensive. She felt like everyone was attacking her all the time when they were trying to talk to her about her home. Um, and this, when you start off with, wow, you know, this is great, you've got a pathway, you're not putting her on the defensive right away. Another thing to do is highlight strengths. All people have strengths, positive aspects of themselves, their behavior, or even their homes. A visitor's ability to notice these strengths helps forge a good relationship and paves the way for resolving the hoarding problem. For example, I see that you can easily access your bathroom sink and shower. What a beautiful painting. I can see how much you care about your cat. So again, these were just ways that I could start a conversation with my mother that wouldn't be setting her on the defensive. Quite the opposite, it would allow her to be a little vulnerable and maybe talk about some of the things that she was normally ashamed of because she recognized, oh, Sam is recognizing uh, these positive aspects of my home or these positive acts about my behavior. And the last one on this list is focus the intervention initially on safety and organization of possessions and later work on discarding. And I'd actually modify this a little bit I would say, instead of focusing on the items themselves, try to focus on the person a little bit. Try to get to know them before you even get to the home. Because by trying to get to the home, so many people have already tried to talk to them. So many people have already tried to help them by discussing their items with them that that might already put them in a defensive position. So I would say, focus a little bit on them as a human so that last uh, one of highlighting their strengths or highlighting something you like about their home. I would start with with focusing on them in some way or you know what about this painting do you like and so you're you're talking about them and what they like and what's going on with them. To me that's a better segue but once you do get to the items I totally agree focusing on safety. Safety is so helpful in my mom's case not just safety of firefighters but safety of anyone who walks into that home the air quality was so bad in her home that you were, you know, I would often end up with a sinus issues for three days after being at my mom's home. And I don't have sinus issues ever, but the home was so filthy and such a biological hazard that my sinuses would respond by getting inflamed and I'd have a three day sinus inflammation. Um, but then, sorry, this last point is Focus the intervention initially on safety. So I focused on safety and organization, safety of you know people's health, because my mom really does care about people's health. Maybe not her own so much, but she does care about the health of her animals. And so that was what I kept focusing on is, hey mom, these animals, they need clean breathing air to have a healthy life. Discussion of the fate of the person's possessions will be necessary at some point, but it is preferable for this discussion to follow work on safety and organization. So they're basically just saying, uh, don't try to solve everything right off the bat. Like if you walk into a hoarder's home, my instinct was like, let's clean this up. Oh my gosh, let's make this much a cleaner environment. I personally am, am a minimalist, as probably evidenced by this wall behind me. Uh, I don't need a lot of possessions in my life. And so when I see a hoarder's home, I think, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming. And um, one of the things that you'll see with a hoarder is they often end up overwhelmed with even the smallest of decisions. Um, if you take a piece of junk mail, let's say in my mom's case, she can't throw any junk mail away, she, just any mail whatsoever. If you take a piece of mail that's five years old and it says, you know, give a dollar a day to save a child in such and such country. My mom cannot throw that item away because she thinks, oh, well, when I get money, I might send to that organization. So she's incapable of making a decision other than to keep it. So her indecisiveness is a decision because it involves keeping everything. So she can't make decisions to get rid of anything. Um, and she's overwhelmed with even talking about it. So if you have a discussion with her about a piece of mail, she will become overwhelmed very quickly and she gets overwhelmed with any decision making about organization or cleanup. And for me to come in and lead with, hey, let's deal with this stuff, it's just overwhelming to her. Um, it's, it's 
playing right into all these triggers she has around certain emotions that she doesn't like to feel, like shame or embarrassment. And so even though I was well-meaning, I was just leading right into the stuff that she was incapable of dealing with. And so by following this process of you know, starting on other things like who she is as a person, some of her strengths, some of the things you like about her home, and then starting with maybe, oh, let's think about safety. And then at the later points, getting to the deeper issues, like in my case, trying to get that uh, carpet out of there, get her animals trained to be defecating and urinating outside rather than inside. I mean, these were the things that took a long time for me to get to. I couldn't start with them. And then I still have more to go. So in my last video, I asked for help um, because I'm at a stage where I, I really think my mom needs some therapy to get to the next level. Even if, if I were a, a hoarding specialist, I should say, and a psychologist, a hoarding um, specialist from a, a, a psychologist who specializes in hoarding disorder, even if I was those things, which I'm not, uh, it would be tough because the dynamic between mother and son would always be there. So at this point, I think my mom needs professional help from outside of the family. And I have discussed this with her and she has agreed to it in the past several times, but then doesn't take the steps um, to go there. So it'll be an ongoing journey for me to try to address the leftover stuff that's still in her home. Uh, but luckily we've gotten through most of the stuff that was threatening her health. Um, so now she has reasonably clean breathing air compared to before. Uh, if you find any of these do's and don'ts helpful, please hit the like button for this video. It's very helpful for me to know that these things are helping people. If you have any comments about your own journey about someone with hoarding, I would love to see your comments and hit subscribe if you're getting anything out of this channel at all. Um, hoarding is on the rise in the US. I think because we're inundated as children with stuff makes you a better person, uh, that idea is in our subconsciouses. So we're constantly trying to have stuff in our life to legitimize our, ourselves. Um, oh, so that guy drives a such and such car that somehow makes them a more legitimate person or oh, that person owns a $2 million home, so that somehow makes them more legitimate in some way. And I think that, I, that idea that's constantly fed to us since we were children uh, leads to us collecting more objects. And so hoarding is definitely on the rise. Um, so I do think more and more people are learning about it and also have maybe one or more individuals in their own life who are hoarders. Or if, if you have a hoarding disorder, I would especially love your comments about some aspect of your experience and things that work well with you and things that trigger you in an unhealthy way. So, um, you know, what are things that work when you are talking to someone? How, how do you want to be addressed? Or, um, yeah, basically any comment would be helpful at this point for someone who is experiencing my mom's side of it because I always look for perspective uh, from different angles. So if you've gotten anything out of this video, I'd really appreciate any comment you might have. Thank you very much for your time and your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day.